We're very, very pleased. It is, it's my pleasure and it's our honor to welcome Rabbi Hanach Teller. I don't think I have to tell you anything about Rabbi Teller. There's a full bio in front of you and I think his reputation far precedes being here. Um, so we are very, very excited and I'm sure you're all going to want to give your attention and later on to, of course, uh, purchase some books. Thank you so much, Rabbi Teller. We're very, very happy to have you here. Thank you very much. After this introduction, I even want to hear what I have to say. Uh, so I want to thank Rebson Steinberg very, very much because this, she said she's pleased. I'm very pleased not only to have such a distinguished audience and many of your granddaughters and grandsons I taught in Israel. Let me look a little bit closer. Maybe it was your sisters and brothers, I can't tell. Uh, but the big thing that I'm so happy about is a chance to pay back to the OU. I, like any Orthodox Jew, has benefited so much from the OU, so when I had a chance now to do something for, on behalf of the OU, I leapt the opportunity. Leapt through the rain, I must add. Okay, so I'm afraid, let me just a little housekeeping before we begin, and that is, first of all, if anyone can help me, I need to ride to Kennedy Airport afterwards. So if anyone's going near that direction, I, I would be appreciative. I need a ride to Kennedy. It's an airport, not nearby. If anyone give me a lift, I'd appreciate. Okay, then, I think I brought, I thought I brought. All right, we'll deal with that later. Uh, so now, the, the real disappointment here is, I pleaded with Representative Steinberg, she gave me a topic I'm not competent to speak about. And the previous speaker, who was so eloquent, was really speaking important words, and I'm gonna disappoint you, and I'm afraid you're gonna want your money back. I have a message to convey, and I don't like when speakers, you know, they say whatever they want to say and then they twist it into the subject. So why mislead you? It's a little bit off. I'll try and make it somewhat connected, but that's the best I can do. But I was, here we are on the cusp of Shavuos. We made a commitment we're going to accept the Torah. Let me tell you an anecdote. Uh, maybe 15, 16, 17 years ago, I was flying to Mexico. About 17 years ago. I don't mind doing this without the mic, but then I, I was flying to Mexico, and sitting next to me, of all people on the plane, was a Frum Jew. In the middle of the flight, he pulls out, his, if you remember, he pulls out his Palm Pilot, and then I pulled out my Palm Pilot. And then this passenger said to me, I have on my Palm, Chamishe Chum Torah, and if you want, I can beam it to you. I said, sure. So he beamed me, Chamishe Chum Torah, and then the palm asked me, do you accept? And <laughs> I almost fell off my chair. So here we are, we're trying to make a commitment. We've made a commitment, now we have to honor the commitment. Which reminds me of a story, and maybe you can relate to this. This from woman made a commitment to go on a diet, not tomorrow, but today. And no sooner had she made the commitment to go on a diet and she was driving down the road past the bakery, and there, staring from the window, was Napoleon oozing custard. Who, she said, must be bashert. But then again, I did make this commitment to go on a diet. But then again, God did arrange this fortuitous encounter between the Claire and myself. I know. I'll wait for a sign from above. I know. If I find a parking space in front of the bakery, then I will know it was meant for me to eat the Napoleon. And sure enough, on her 14th time around the block, <laughs> she found a parking space in front of the bakery. Okay, so here I am for a month, dreading, I speak a lot, but dreading this opportunity because what am I gonna say on this topic? I don't know what to do. And then Shavuos night, Kashbarcho Hu sort of delivered. He showed me a Gemara while I was learning it, and then all of a sudden, Gavaldik says the Gemara. Let's find it. Hmm. Supposed to be prepared, not look like okay. Please don't go away. Let me just find it. Okay, the Gemara asks a question in Sanhedrin. You dalid. My zaken, what is considered an elderly person? My zaken, and then the Gemara gets off on a subject, on a tangent. We never really answer the question, but it comes back and it says a zaken is one, a elderly person who is deserving of respect is one who has smicha. One who has 
the yoke of responsibility from the community upon their shoulders. And then Rabbi Zera tells a story that he would do everything possible to avoid getting smicha because he never wanted to be in the limelight. And then, then one person said to him, on the contrary, Ein adam ola elim kein If a person accepts responsibility upon their shoulders, then all of their sins are forgiven. What could be better than this? And the Gemara never resolves this dispute. There are two opinions. But since the last one is the latter opinion, apparently accepting responsibility is the preferred, the preferred route, even if it means going, stepping into the limelight. So here we go. That was my, as it were, segue and connection. What I want to speak about is how we can do something small. It can have a large impact. You know, something which is seemingly insignificant and piddling can really be resplendent and chivalrous and grand. I heard a story from Rabbi Beryl Wine about a person in Southern California, newly religious. What made this person decide to become religious? Very interesting story. One afternoon, evening, he was driving down, driving with his non-Jewish girlfriend in his convertible. I kind of like that. <laughs> non-Jewish girlfriend in his convertible. And they're going to a rock concert one afternoon, evening. They come to an intersection, and a big Mexican cop is holding up the traffic. Light turns green, light turns red, light turns green, light turns red. Meanwhile, here he is with his girlfriend. They're late for the concert. He begins to honk. Now, those of you here from New York, you know if you honk, it means you're merely alive. But in Southern California, this is a major cataclysmic event. Cops are over, hey, bud, what's the prob? He holds out the tickets. I'm here with my girlfriend. We're late for the concert. What's holding up everything? Don't you know? Know what? Why don't you know what? Tonight is Yom Kippur. I'm helping the people walk to synagogue. And he didn't know, but he wanted to know, and that made all the difference. Every Israeli city, with perhaps the exception of Kiryat Sefer, has a Nordau street. Max Nordau. What was his first name? Rehov. Little joke. I stress very little. <laughs> but I thought it was funny. OK. Who, who is this Nordau has so many streets named after him? He wasn't head of the Asphalt Commission. Nordau, and if you don't know this, you need not be embarrassed, was the second in command to Theodor Herzl, the architect of the Zionist plan. And the great enigma of modern Jewish history is why would Nordau, a man well ensconced in Viennese society, married to a non-Jewish woman, later Parisian society, why would he get so involved in building the Jewish state? And I found the answer in his diary where he writes that in Vienna there was a Hasidic couple which had but one child, a 10-year-old girl, who was struck low with a terrible, debilitating disease. They went from doctor to doctor to doctor. No one could diagnose without a diagnosis, no prognosis. And it appeared that she would die. In desperation, they turned to the greatest diagnostician in the entire Austro-Hungarian Empire, Professor Max Nordau. Nordau did his research, prescribed medication which gave rise to a cure. Two years later, the girl was fully recovered. And they returned the Hasidic family with all the trappings, Langerekel, bulletproof stockings, a hat large enough to be a shayla of Ohel on Shabbos. And he turned and said, Herr Doctor, you've returned to us our greatest possession, our only child, but you never sent me a bill. Now, I'm not a wealthy man, but whatever you charge, it would be my pleasure to pay. Nordau writes in his diary, I didn't want any money. All I wanted is lovely child should give me a kiss. Parents turned crimson red. Girls said, but, 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 but. She's 12 years old. She went to the local base, Yaakov. I can't kiss a strange man. Nordau writes, I recovered from the insult. and said, tell me, little girl, what did you learn today in school? Why, today in school, we learned to say how Yaakov was traveling along the way, but there, Hefrata, and there, Rachel, Rachel died. And instead of burying with the other four fathers and four mothers are buried in Hebron, he buried her there. She could offer solace and comfort, as the prophet says, a voice is heard, Rachel Malkan Rachel is crying for children. And there's every word for all your efforts, Vishavu Vanim Ligvulam. And your children, they will return to their borders. When he heard these words, he said, Maidla, 
Do you honestly and truly believe that the close to 2,000 years of exile, indeed the Jews will return to their borders? She put her hand on her heart. Of course I believe it, for it says so in my Torah. At that moment, Nordo understood indeed they would return and pledged the rest of his life to building the Jewish state. One little girl, internalizing a lesson, changed all of modern Jewish history. More contemporaneously, the best class I ever taught, I teach in seminary, also read in yeshiva, I teach in seminary, and the best class I ever taught was a class I never taught. One day I walked into a very prestigious school, I believe, and all the girls from Baltimore, which I'm wont to refer to as Baltimoreans, <laughs> were crying, crying like it was Tisha B'Av. I asked, what's, what's going on? And they told me their beloved high school principal, Rabbi Steinberg, had passed away. I never saw a high school student crying at the passing of a principal. In the best class I ever gave, I asked the Baltimoreans, do us a favor, get up and share with us your reminiscences of Rabbi Steinberg. And every girl began by saying they were Rabbi Steinberg's favorite pupil. And that was not fake or rooney. That was the man's genius, making everyone feel important. And the last girl gets up, and I'm telling you as a teacher, very much a plain Jane, nice kid but not all that gray matter, all that much gray matter. And she gets up and she says she too was Rabbi Steinberg's favorite student. And the last day of school, and perhaps you know this better than I, it is meaningful for a high school student to have the yearbook signed by the principal, particularly if you care for him. And not only would he sign it, he would personalize it with a little poem directly towards that student. And she, the last day of school, she wasn't there. This was on a Tuesday, and on Thursday, she was flying to Israel. Rabbi Steinberg, at the end of his life, was very, very ill, and he knew that he was dying. Tuesday, she wasn't in school. Wednesday, he was going into the hospital for treatment. Thursday, she was flying to Israel. On his own accord and volition on Wednesday, on his way to the hospital, he stopped off at her house. He personalized her yearbook, then went on for his treatment. And when she related the story, I thought to myself, I wonder, I did write about him. And that one small deed, now many people know about this man. And one thing can make quite a difference. One last story, trust me, there'll be more, but on this, I, this idea, Rav Moshe Feinstein, the tremendous guttle of America, his custom was he would learn in his yeshiva in lower Manhattan in the morning, daven mincha, then eat lunch, and then he would be driven home. And he made it his business each and every day, he would thank the cook for the tasty meal before he left yeshiva. One day they raced him out for some important meeting, and he didn't have a chance to thank the cook. The first time he had a spare second in the afternoon, he called yeshiva, and you can imagine, or maybe you can't, how this woman felt when they told her the Gadol Hador, the most prominent rabbi of the generations on the phone, he wants to thank you for lunch. For him, it was just a phone call, but for her, the highlight of her life. And small things can make quite a difference. Now, this idea, how something small can be so significant. Oh, I skipped. All right. All right. So this idea. All right. I'm not going to. I'm going to. You know, it's very rabbinic to end several times. So I said last story. One more. Uh, I don't know if you ever walked into. I'm addressing more the people, the male persuasion here. If you ever walked into the headquarters of, da, of uh, Dialadav, be it in Brooklyn or Shalayim, I am dubious if TDK and Sony Warehouse has as many cassettes and CDs. There's oceans and mountain ranges of so many shurim. And I thought, I was thinking, who thought of this? I can tell that you're not as curious as I. <laughs> I think of things that other people are not thinking about. But I was overwhelmed. Who thought of this idea? And I researched, and this is what I came up with. I didn't come up with it. But I, the story is the following. Mayor... Applebaum, Mayor Applebaum, washed up on the shores of America an orphan after World War II, and his new home became the Torah Vedash Yeshiva in Brooklyn. Very responsible boy, and they made him the dorm proctor, and to earn a little money, he opened up a canteen selling licorice and potato chips and soda, and whatever it is you sell in the canteen. And he saved his pennies, nickels, and dimes, and then in 1959, 
he was able to fill the dream of a lifetime and travel to Israel. Now, in 1959, I know you wouldn't remember this, but I'm 27, I don't even remember this. In 1959, it's not like you get in an airport, you go to Kennedy, and 10 hours later you're in Israel. It's a long, protracted journey by propeller plane, one leg, another leg, and then another leg, no kosher meals. And Mayor Applebaum is now going to Israel. He arrives at the airport and he said, never before did I ever feel so much like a yosom, like an orphan. Whoever else was traveling was there with their whole entourage and their baba, and the baba shchente, and shchente's baba, and relatives with food and fruit and mazonas to tide them over in this long, protracted journey. And he was all by himself. Meanwhile, back at yeshiva, Hirsch Flam, an acquaintance, not kushi kushi, just an acquaintance, said, Mayor is flying to Israel. And no one went to bid him farewell. He went outside, hailed a taxi, hey ta got a ring to it, hey taxi. And this is before the days of terrorists and security. And he went with the cab right onto the tarmac. Just as Mayor was ascending up the gangplank and he calls out, Mayor, Mayor. The two friends embraced, their tears fused, and Mayor never forgot that gesture of, of friendliness that Hirsch had done for him. When he came back from Israel two years later, he learned the good news that Hirsch was engaged to be married. I said that just in case you're from England and you thought he was engaged to be on the telephone. And I just came from England, so. <laughs> and then he heard he wasn't well. He was admitted to hospital with multiple sclerosis. And I'm sure you all know MS is a horrific muscular disorder which wreaks havoc on the muscular system, but the brain is as lucid as before. And Mayer wanted to do something for him. Hirsch's greatest love was the love of Torah, but totally incapacitated in the hospital. 1961 was the beginning of the audio cassette industry. Mayor Applebaum, never forgetting what Hirsch had done for him, went out, purchased two tape recorders, numerous cassettes. He recorded Rebbeim and Yeshiva their shiurim, which he then brought to the hospital. And other patients, curious to hear the shiurim, not only does it provide Talmud Torah, it also provided a Bikr Cholim. And that's how the audio cassette industry, of that's how the Torah tapes began. So thus, if you're driving in a car, doing the dishes, low-impact jogging, swimming, that's ridiculous, <laughs> and you're listening to a shear, it's all thanks to that one gesture of friendliness that Hirsch had done for, her, for Mayer so many years earlier, and we're still benefiting from this one act. This idea that something small can be significant, with Chazal called, Eina Dol Koshbarcha Noseng Gdula La'adam Ajabot Kehu, God never awards greatness to an individual until he first tests them on the small little matters, on the pitch of kids, if you will. The, the motto of Boy Scouts, just in case you're not familiar, you know, when I travel, if people want to be cruel to me, unwittingly, they put me in the room with the books. Basically, I'm illiterate, but I'm always curious to see what other people are reading. So I just was, young if I was in uh, the Midwest, it's in Columbus. And there is, I came across the Boy Scout Manual. Now, I don't think you've ever seen this book. Fascinating book, yay thick. The most fascinating, all right, the part about folding flags is kind of boring and tying knots. But if you're ever lost in the forest, second to a cellular phone, this book is indispensable. And the motto of Boy Scouts, in case you're not familiar, is be prepared. All right, he's do a good turn daily. Do a good turn daily. So there's a story that a Boy Scout came late to his meeting. And you know what happens is, is that a boy scout came late to his meeting, and uh, he's five minutes late. Another boy scout comes another 10 minutes late. And the scout master says, where were you? He says, I was doing my good turn. Another comes another five minutes late. Where were you? I was doing my good turn. Another came another five minutes later. Where were you? Doing my good turn. The rest of the pack rolled in 25 minutes later. Where were you? We were doing our good turn. What were you doing? Helping an old blind lady cross the street. What took so long? She didn't want to cross. <laughs> so everybody always wants to do the major league chasadim, help the old lady cross the street. But it's the small things that make the great difference. The people who can do the dishes, take out the, diap you know, take out the diapers, take out the garbage, these are the small things that make a great individual. You know, my house, we're blessed with a lot of children. 18 to be more specific. And so we have, our house is a balagan, there's people always running around, the decibels are loud on a Friday.
But one thing I'm always particular about is that Friday afternoon, no matter what, we always have company, the table should be set. I want the guests to know that we're prepared for them. We may not, everything else may be a wreck, but let them see that we're anticipating them because that's what God did for us. Before Adam was invited into the world, God prepared the world. Trees and grass and clouds and water, because Shulchan Aruch got it all set. A set table when they were invited into the world. Okay. Louder, certainly. You know, the microphone is what's holding me back. If I would just belt it out, you know what I'll do? I'll go back to the beginning. <laughs> the Rav once spoke, Rabbi Soloveitchik, spoke in Rutgers. Is this loud enough? He spoke in Rutgers many, many years ago. And the, the microphone was camouflaged by his beard. And the Rav, you know, bless his holy soul, he would speak very protracted. He'd speak for hours. I remember as a kid, I went to Boston every single Motsi Shabbos, and I sat like this, praying he would never end. But he was, he spoke for long durations of time. So after an hour and three quarters, someone said to the Rav, we can't hear you. And the Rav said, all right. I'll go back to the beginning. So, so you don't want that. <laughs> we'll continue. Nice and loud, though. Okay. Now, this idea, how something small can be significant and resplendent and chivalrous and grand, this was developed in the Slobodka Yeshiva, where in Slobodka they taught godless Adam. Every act is significant, the greatness of man. There's nothing, something which is small and insignificant. Everything can make a major difference. The author of Slobodka taught, he said he only taught one lesson. The fact of the matter is he taught hundreds of lessons. It's like Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky. He told me he only wrote one book. Now we know he's written 40 to 50 titles, but he claims it's one book, the book of self-esteem. Self-esteem in Pirkei Avos, self-esteem on Mesil Sharm, self-esteem on self-esteem. So the author taught the greatness of man. If you had an image of who you are, and even as we get into the golden years of what we are, then we can never do something that would be sapasnish, un unbefitting for ourselves. When I was nine years old, I visited a bungalow colony. Do I have to explain what a bung bungalow colony is? <laughs> you know, it's funny, but it's funny. I mean, it's funny because it does require an explanation. People abandoned their beautiful homes. I mean, I should only live in the winter the way they live in the summer, but it used to be these farstunken, redolent, <laughs> you know, the mosquito screen, screen was always punched in for the mosquitoes to feel Hamish. So uh, I was in this bungalow kind, I was nine years old, and this bungalow kind was half religious, half not yet religious. And there was a woman who was traipsing around in her bathing suit, and they told me, go tell the lady to get dressed. I'm a kid, I don't know anybody there, uh, go tell her to get So I told the woman, that I had heard that Princess Margaret was caught by a photographer in his telephoto lens, she was in her bathing suit, and the next day it was printed in all the tabloids, and it created such a scandal, Parliament almost resigned. True story. It said, we believe that all Jewish women are Prince I, Princess I, princesses, and it behooves a princess to dress accordingly. And she wasn't ashamed. She put on a beach towel. That's if you have the image of the godless Adam, the greatness of man. Once the altar was talking with a student as they're waiting for a train, a non Jew came by, you see a rabbi, what do you do? He tossed a rock at them, and the altar said, Ashad, a pity. Had he only heard my lecture about the greatness of man, he never would have tossed a rock. You can't think you're a prince and act like a hoodlum. Now, the Slobodki Yeshiva moved from Slobodka to, I'll give you a multiple choice Woodmere, Hewlett, Inwood, Chevron, none of the above. No, it was C was the correct answer. Uh, Chevron is the correct answer. Until the massacre in Tarpat in 1929. And in that massacre, the Arabs, may their names be forever eradicated, caught two boys, of course they murdered 79. They caught two boys in a room and they began to slice, I use the word accurately. One boy was sliced over 100 times. One was basically just phased. Said the critically wounded student, the fatally wounded student to his colleague, I shall crawl upon you, my blood will smear over you, and they will think that you too are dead. His last gasping breath, 
His final gesticulation was to spare the life of a fellow student. That's the greatness of man till the very end. And when she was still yet in Slobodka, Lithuania, one day the Hulums grabbed a boy, not even Bar Mitzvah boy, 12-year-old boy, and they grabbed him and they brought him to the Rosh Hashiva of Moshe Mordechai Epstein. They said, give us a ransom of 10,000 ruble or we'll shoot this boy dead. Moshe Mordechai didn't even have a kapaka, have a penny. They took the boy out, stripped him naked, they brought him to the town plaza, and they aimed their rifles. And when Moshe Mordechai schooled in the doctrine of Slobodka, he knew he had to do something, yet he knew not what to do. He held his breath, clenched his eyes, and ran, ran out and began to scream and shout incoherent sentences, and a crowd formed. Hudlums got so confounded with pointing the rifles in every direction, he continued to scream, to shout, to rant, and to rave. Hudlums got more and more confounded, and in the end they ran away, sparing the life of little Yaakov Ruderman, later to become the Rosh Hashiva of Neisro in Baltimore, and a pioneer of American Jewry. Every act is significant. Now, this idea, I'm telling you from Slobodka, we have it in the Torah itself. How did Moshe Rabbeinu become the leader of the Jewish people? I'm sure you're all familiar with the Medrash, that he was a shepherd. And one day he saw Shepsla was missing, and he found the sheep drinking water at the brook, and he was chagrined. He had been delinquent in his responsibility as a shepherd. And he put the Shepsla on his shoulder and brought the sheep back to the flock, and God said, I want this man to be my shepherd. Thus saith the Medrash. But the Gemara says something else. The Torah, the Torah says, Moshe was walking in the wilderness and he sees a bush which is burning, yet it's not consumed. As soon I'm going to go out of my way to see this godly sight. How much did he go out of his way to see this godly sight? It's polemic in the Talmud. One opinion of Yochanan says he went three steps out of his way. Reish Lakish says he turned his neck. That's all he did. It was the smallest of gestures. But to go out of your way for a godly sight, even the smallest thing, that bespeaks greatness. By the way, you tell your husband, you know, there's a bush which is burning, but it's not consumed. Okay, honey, but I got to go to work. You called the fire department. I, I got to run. Going out of your way for something godly, that bespeaks greatness. And the very same Torah portion, Batya went down to the water to bathe. And what happened? She sees the baby far out in the river, and she extends her hand. How far? So Rashi quotes the Gemara in Saita, her hand elongated and outstretched. Now wasn't that a silly thing to do? The baby was so far away. But she managed, her hand went out and pulled in the baby. And the take home message that I understand it is, you have to be willing to do your small little part. And then you will see that the dividends will always be greater than the investment. By the way, this story of Batya stretching out her hand was the motto of the Panovich Rav. I hope that name is familiar to you. If not, I can recommend the biography. Hint, hint. So the Panovich Rav, his motto was Batya stretching out her hand. The Panovich Rav was the man most responsible for the renaissance of yeshiva learning after the Holocaust. As a matter of fact, now, as we all know, you know this very well, I know where you're living, to, have, to, raise, to make yeshivos requires financial support, and he was the greatest fundraiser in the history of history. As a matter of fact, in 1969, there was a great debate if there was life on the moon. This debate was triggered by the lunar landing, and the Satmar, there's a great debate, is there life on the moon? The Satmar Rebbe said, I know for sure there's no life on the moon. Favana Vestu, how do you know? All the scientists are arguing. How do you know? He said, simple, Bosh. If there'd be life on the moon, the Pandavich Arab would have gone there collecting. <laughs> Where didn't he go? And he used his wit. And here he is, World War II. And the mindset in Israel is not to be learning in yeshiva. Rommel was poised to attack. If you had your wits about you, you went to Kevarachal, said a capital till him, and he's building yeshiva. And not just yeshiva. I and mean, if you're going to build a yeshiva, rooftops, 50, 60. And he's building yeshiva. Yeah, 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 yeah. For 600 boys. Piss them sugar. And he said, you're dreaming. He said, yes, I'm dreaming. But my eyes are open. And that great visionary built. And then, when World War II is over, 
the orphans began to trickle into Israel. He stopped everything that he was doing and devoted himself exclusively to caring for the orphans, the boys and the girls. He made for them homes. He'd walk into the orchards with them, sing the ghetto songs. And for them too, he had to raise money. He was in Detroit, Michigan, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And a famously wealthy woman said, Rabbi, I like what you're doing for the orphans, but we don't share the same agenda. You know, the yarmulke that sits, this is not for me. I'll give you money provided. No one entered the school with the yarmulke at Sitsis. He said, fair enough. He took her money, and with that money, opened up the first girls' school in B'nai Brak. <laughs> Always with the wit. And one last. He went to a fellow to collect money, a man with very deep pockets. I happen to know who this is, a doctor. Not a religious man, but this doctor's precursors were religious. He comes into the doctor's home, and on the wall is a painting of the doctor's grandfather, a Jew with a hydrous a beard, pay is coming down. <clears throat> and the Panovich Rav said, Ah, oh, what I wouldn't give to have this painting adorn the library in Panovich. The doctor is very impressed. Do you really mean, ah, oh, what I wouldn't give them only we could have this painting grace the library in Panovich. doctor knew that Panovich was not a fly by night yeshiva. Rabbi, are you pulling my leg? No, it would mean everything. If only we could have this painting grace the library in Panovich. Doctor was so impressed. He said, Tell me, Rabbi, how much of a library do you have? He said, So far, just the painting. <laughs> Needless to say, he got the doctor to pay for the books to go around the painting. The motto was, Stretch out your hand. Okay, we're going to skip a little bit. Not that you would know. Uh, I had a student in Israel. Well, let me go back to the beginning. There's a boy in Israel. A newly religious boy about Tshuva, and his sister was in India, not studying but practicing the Eastern religions. Oh, Swami, the whole. Ugh. And he felt he had to do something, at least make one small little act, one gesture to bring her back. So he told her, I want you to fly to Israel. I'll pay for all the accommodations, travel, hotel, provide a contingent. You attend one class in the Veyushalayim, a seminary for beginners. She thought about it, decided that her karma was in order, and made the trip. She's there for two weeks. The trip is almost over, and she had not yet fulfilled her part of the bargain. She walked into the day one afternoon. It wasn't the best day. Teller wasn't teaching. And she walked in what we call in yeshivas a very truck and a very dry sheer, a, law, a sheer about the laws of returning a lost item. Mit the simon, on the simon, mit yeyush, on yeyush. Has the owner despaired? Has the owner not despaired? Does it have identifying mark? Does it not have identifying mark? And all these technicalities did not appeal to her. And she flew back to India. No more than three weeks had lapsed, and she's walking the marketplace with her guru, and he discovered a wallet in the market, which he pockets. And she said, Papa, but, but there's an owner. You have to notify the owner. He said, No, no, no. I'm not keeping for myself. I'm going to donate to the ashram. She said, but there's an owner. How will the owner know unless you notify and announce? And don't worry, it's not for me. I'm giving to the ashram. And she was so appalled with his behavior. After what she had learned in Yushalayim, she then became a student of mine in Yushalayim. And we never know how one small thing can make a difference. I'm trying to connect this all how we have lives that are filled with so many things. And we can never, we always have to make that gesture because we never know what the dividends will be. Now, just like good things can work for the good, why, why it also worked for the bad. We don't have to focus on that. We'll skip that. Okay. Uh, so now the question is, but it can work for the bad. People sometimes are experts in making a big deal out of nothing. A big spritz out of nothing. I live in a neighborhood in Jerusalem which has a predominant, used to have a very strong number of retired American rabbis. And uh, one rabbi, very inflated image of himself, Winston Churchill once said, true my opponent is a modest man, and he has very good reason, <laughs> very good reason to be modest. Uh, so this rabbi had a very high image of himself, and one day, the day that Rav Moshe Feinstein passed away, in my neighborhood is Rav Moshe Feinstein's 
great nephew. Needless to say, Moshe would be great without this nephew, but... And this fellow was crying, walking through the neighborhood, crying, just crying and crying. And this fellow said, what's, what's he crying about? He said, Rav Moshe was nifter. He said, Feinstein? Feinstein, that he's crying about? And he told me the following, he said the following story. He said, he was a Rav, I don't want to identify, but he was a Rav in a neighborhood in New York. And he had a question about a get. And so he called it Rav Moshe. He said, who do you think answered the phone? Rav Moshe himself. How important could he be he answers the phone? So he said, I'm coming right away. Don't do anything. Don't do the get. I'm coming right away. So he said, should I send a car service? He said, no, I'll take, it. I'll take a subway. And the rabbi said, you know, how important could it be? He answers the phone. He takes a subway. I said, <laughs> this Rabbi Moshe realizes that if you get involved, you're going to mess everything up. So therefore, he's a humble man. He takes a subway. He answers the phone. And you think, and this happens. Sometimes we make a big deal. You know, people make bar mitzvahs. I call them bizarre mitzvahs. You know, they rent the QE2. You're making, it's too big, it's too big. We want to make something small significant, but not the wrong thing. And this raises the question, how can we make something significant without the deleterious and insidious side effects? And the answer, I believe, is one of perspective. There's this fabulously wealthy American woman who had donated millions of dollars to the Israeli army and Israelis has been very pragmatic, realized she'd given so much, she could probably give more. So they decided to name an army base in Negev in her honor. They invited her for the tekes, for the ceremony. And they met her at the airport with generals and command cars. They whisk her off, blobby, 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 blob. And they arrive at the army base, just as the soldiers going through the basic training through the obstacle course, falling into a pit, jumping out of a pit, falling into a pit, climbing out of a pit, falling into a pit, climbing. She turns to the general, I've given you so many millions of dollars, and you can't fix the road? <laughs> and she looks at him, and he looks at her. So what's our perspective? We're too small a people to be a small people. Too small for internecine fights, for pigeonholing. And ironically, Judaism teaches the most effective way to make yourself significant is to be part of a tzibor, part of a crowd, part of a, an audience. The best example, of course, is Minyan. We believe that when we pray by ourselves, we're naked and exposed. But when you dive with a Minyan, it's everyone fused and amalgamated together. Beryl is about Stoka, and Chatzkel is Mazakis Arabin, and Yankel is a very pious person. Everyone is fused together. There's a story that professor in university administered a test. He didn't, I'm sorry, he didn't administer, he gave it to a proctor. And the proctor announced to the students, listen very carefully, you have one hour and 50 minutes for this exam and not one second longer. You go one minute over one hour and 50 minutes and you failed. One hour and 50 minutes later, there's a neat tall pile of exams on the teacher's desk and one student was still copiously filling out his exam. When two hours had lapsed, he attempted to hand in his paper. And the proctor said, you failed. The student said, do you know who I am? And the proctor said, I don't know, and I don't care. The student said, you don't know who I am? He said, I don't know, and I don't care. The student took off his eyeglasses, looked in the eye, and said, you don't know my name? He said, I don't know, and I don't care. The student said, great. Took the test, shoved it in the middle of the pile, and ran away. <laughs> Marai Rabotai, that is the power of a tzibur. What we can't accomplish by ourselves, we can't accomplish when we're all united. That's the kaiyach Okay. So the Pasuk says, we're almost done. The verse says, Atama Ami Kola Ami, we're the smallest of all nations, but we dare not be small. And if you ever travel far away, you ever go on a vacation, <laughs> my favorite oxymoron is family vacation. <laughs> As if there was such a thing. Okay, so you go far away, what happens? You travel who knows where, and you meet a fellow Jew. What happens? Yeah, you know, Beryl, Shmerel, Chatzko, Yanko. And I always want to know, is it just us or any minority? And I've been watching, and I have a feeling, you know, I, I watch people, other minorities, the only ones, they just see each other, they go right past. But you see someone else, a fellow Jew. You don't just, <laughs> Shalom Aleichem, give me some money. You don't just, <laughs> 
just walked past him. I was in Omaha, Nebraska, which Jewishly is pretty far away. And I walked into a supermarket, and this girl calls out at the top of her lungs, Ema, to the woman standing right next to her, what time is candle lighting? A critical question for Tuesday afternoon. Because you can't resist when you see a fellow Jew. And why is that? Says the Or Sameach, because we were all together at Sinai. And we understand that our destiny is linked together. And even those Jews who have jettisoned the cargo of the Judaism cannot resist living in Jewish neighborhoods, talking to Jews, because that's part of us. We're the smallest of our people, yet we dare not be small. Okay, let me just end with a story. Uh, a story which was so profound, I ended up writing a book because of this. This story happened 18 and a half years ago, even though I'm only 27. But 18 and a half years ago, Erev Yom Kippur is the most crowded day in the men mikvah. And I live in a pretty devout neighborhood in Jerusalem, and Erev Yom Kippur, it's SRO, squeeze room only. And it's all Hasidim and Yerushalmim, Everybody wishing good yant of good and it's very, very boisterous and noisy. And yich. Everyone's on top of each other. Ugh. I really don't want to describe this to you. And I cannot tell you the story delicately because in the mikvah there's no way to conceal because everything is revealed. And everyone's ugh. again boisterous and noisy. And there's one kid from across the street from the Or Sameach Yeshiva for Beginners. How do I know it was from Or Sameach? It said on his t-shirt, Or Sameach rest, I'm just joking. He had a, an earring and a ponytail, clearly he was not a chosid nor a Yushalmi. And this kid felt legitimately very, very much out of place in this mikvah. And he placed his palms over his biceps, very apparent to me and to others, that he had a tattoo that was not appropriate for Erev Yom Kippur. I dare say not appropriate for a Gansher or Freilich, but certainly not the eve of Yom Kippur. And the people in this mikvah are not especially subtle, about as subtle as heavy metal is subtle. And they're gawking and gaping this poor kid who's highly embarrassed. He's about to step into the pool, and he slips and trips and grabs the rail, and there's this roaring silence in the mikvah, sphinx-like silence. Picture a forest after trees felled. Imagine the Mudville statement after Mighty Casey struck out. No one is moving. Before it was so boisterous, and now it's as if we went deaf. You can hear heartbeats. No one is moving. The kid turned alabaster. He died a thousand deaths. I saw him cogitating, he'll jump in, he'll never come out. In my entire life, I have never, ever witnessed so much embarrassment. And then an elderly neighbor of mine walked across the moist marble floor. This happened 18 and a half years ago, and I can still hear in my ears the thwack, 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 as it walks across the moist marble floor and goes over to this kid who's more dead than alive and says to him in his heavily Yiddishy, European accent in English, Don't will young come on. I also have a tattoo, pointing to the numbers going up his arm. In other words, you went through your Gehenim, and I went through my Gehenim. Let's begin Yom Kippur together. Kid came back to life. Spontaneous, ever wished him a good year, and a shana tova. I said, one small thing can make all the difference in the world. So we don't need such dramatic examples. I'm addressing a conference of retirees. You have lives that are filled with acts that are so significant. And that's, we have to just keep riding on the cusp, more and more, and never be little, it's one small thing, the difference that it can make. I've written some books, and uh, I have amazing stories. I'll just tell you one, one, one this is not meant as self-promotion, but it, it highlights the idea. I was speaking in New Orleans. And you know, it's amazing, I ended, and now I'm ending again. I can't, you can't get out of it. I was speaking in New Orleans, and the, a fellow introduced himself, he's a judge. His last name is Solomon, I don't remember the first name. And he told me, married to a non-Jewish woman, that, I'm sure you know this, if you ever want to prevent a school, a day school, or a shul, the oldest trick in the book, 
is you invoke zoning. So he told me they were going to open up a day school in New Orleans, New Orleans as they call it, and he was the presiding judge, and for some mina shamayim, as these stories always are, my book entitled Courtrooms of the Mind ended up in his house the night before. He was intrigued by the title, he read the book, and the next day he greased the day school right through the court, even though that was not his agenda whatsoever. When Nazan know you can write a book in Shalayim and then a judge in New Orleans will open up a day school, and who knows how many hundreds of kids are now had a religious education, stayed within the faith thanks to this day school. Okay, I just want to congratulate you. Uh, I'm 27, you may be a year or two older than that. And uh, we want to celebrate these acts that we've done to never belittle what they can do and what they can accomplish. Okay, as was mentioned, I think I have over on the side my books and my CDs. I think you'll find them enriching. I know I will. Uh, this is my latest book about the Mir Rosh Hashiva. In the Mir, they say this is worth millions. I'm selling it for a fraction. And as was mentioned, the deal is take two, the third one is free. Thank you so very much. Oh, one more thing. Who's looking for this? If anyone is interested, any questions? I will mention that. I have, I made a produced a funny video. If you put your email down, I'll send it to you. I'll put this list over there.